<clears throat> so welcome to IFAST University. Um, the proposed topic, I believe, was energy systems training after rehab, but I think we can loosen that up a little bit as we want to, if we if we choose to. So if there's something specific that you wanted to ask and that falls somewhere in that general vicinity of the category, then I think I'm okay with that. So um, does anybody that is on have anything specific they would like to discuss first? And then if not, I can dive into a question. So don't all um, answer at once. I I, put, I wrote a question because Lance wanted us to write questions. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That was, to be, that was supposed to be the rules, but I guess we're breaking I, the rules. No, I, I do have them. I do have them. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted, with everyone so into cardiac output training, yeah. cardiac output training, um, right, 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 right. you and I had a conversation about what we actually think is happening uh -huh. and how eccentric adaptations maybe aren't happening at that right. to such a degree. Right. Um, you want to try to unpack that? Sure, sure. Um, <clears throat> okay. So, so the, the general premise is, is that training um, at a certain heart rate pr promotes a certain type of cardiac ad adaptation. There's probably some element of truth to that, but I think it's only going to occur at the extreme. So if we're talking about eccentric cardiac hypertrophy, which would be the uh, expansion of the left ventricle, the the, sheer, the the true volume of it by eccentrically orienting the, the muscle tissue uh, in a favorable way to expand the amount of blood that is pumped per beat um, it is somehow beneficial to, to training it. Probably at the extremes where we're talking about uh, the thing that pops into my head is because of the amount of volume that they do is that the Kenyan distance runners probably do have some form of eccentric cardiac hypertrophy associated with years and years and years and years and years, and years of running at, at a, at what it, I'm sure it's a very fast pace for us normal humans, but, but for them it's probably just sort of a lot of medium to medium high work over long durations to running two hours at a time, twice a day or multiple times a day or however they do it. In, in most cases, I would hazard to guess that it doesn't happen a whole lot with, with our traditional athletes that we, that we would typically train that aren't these type of, of athletes. So maybe if you get a triathlete, maybe they have some, um, some element of that. But there's a really neat concept um, in regards to how the heart behaves um, in regards to uh, how, it, how it beats and then how blood flows through the heart. So with every beat of the heart, there is a, a, a point where the valves of the heart are all closed. So the aortic valve and the mitral valves are all closed. And that is called the isovolumetric phase, right? So it's isovolumetric because the volume is fixed and then there's no change. And then as the heart beats and then the blood leaves the heart, um, that isovolumetric phase is over. And so there's a specific duration um, with which that, that isovolumetric phase occurs. As heart rate increases, the isovolumetric phase decreases in duration. So it kind of makes sense, right? So if your heart's gonna be faster, that phase where the, all the valves are closed would be shorter because the heart, heart rate is going to assure that blood is flowing at a certain rate as well. The neat thing is, is that <clears throat> once I reach a point of a certain heart rate, there's a point where the isovolumetric phase totally disappears, which means that there's a point where the mitral valves and the aortic valve are open at the same time, which means that blood flows straight through the heart, which is kind of cool when you think about it. Um, it just so happens that this tends to occur around 140 beats per minute, which is well within the, the typical range that's prescribed in regards to cardiac output development. Um, if you read uh, adaptations in sports training by V. Rue, and I think that, um, that some of the uh, um, uh, omega wave based um, information from 
uh, Val, Val and Zedkin would sort of fall into that category. I think they, they're, the, the range for VRU is like 120 to 150. So if we can, if we can uh, take a leap here and uh, um, say that there's some individuality as to when this isovolumetric phase, phase ends and, and the blood flows freely through the heart, we might be able to say that, okay, so somewhere between 120, 150 beats per minute is when that phase occurs. And that just so happens to be the point where cardiac output is maximized. So think about this, if blood flows through the heart without it having to beat, then the amount of blood that's output from the heart has increased. And so again, without any um, volume-based adaptation in the left ventricle, we have just increased our cardiac output by training at this this point where the isovolumetric phase disappears. So that's kind of what um, what I'm thinking is is probably happening. At least, you know, again, and I can't I can't uh, determine whether. Uh, there are no eccentric adaptations or not, but this this phase where the valves are open does occur, and it does occur uh, conveniently within the typically recommended cardiac output range. Another little twist of fate in regards to the heart um, is that so in in school it's it's uh, stroke volume times heart rate equals cardiac output. Um, Another thing to consider is if I am sitting immobile, right? So I'm not expending a whole lot of energy other than my resting metabolic rate, and you do something to increase my heart rate, cardiac output does not increase. So cardiac output is associated with physical activity. So again, all this stuff kind of just goes hand in hand. Um, if I increase my physical activity to a certain level, my heart rate will increase, my heart rate increases, it goes to a certain point, or I, I no longer have this isovolumetric phase, and then I'm maximizing my cardiac output. So that's kind of how it works. Did that flesh it out a bit for you? It's just interesting to hear a different perspective because as you right. always say, if you can't measure it, you don't really care. So I don't. If you can't I don't. Right. Adaptations of the left ventricle, then right. Might not. Who cares? It's even if it's even happening. Like, if does it work? Did it work for you? Right. That's probably right. better. Than why? Yeah. And then you I mean, figure it, out it, in yours. Yeah, this, this stuff because it, it's it's more of like a, a, a historical viewpoint as 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 much of sports science. It's, it's basically you know, the coaches and the trainers figure stuff out that works. And then you go into the lab and measure and you say, okay, well, why does this work? Yeah. Because training like that certainly does lower resting heart rates, if that's what you're going after. And I don't know yeah. necessarily what it is doing, but yeah. I have had, I've worked with lots of athletes who <clears throat> drop their heart rate, resting heart rate significantly just by doing that for like sure. five weeks. Sure, but I've had people that have strength trained that, that lower the resting heart rate as well. So you know, yeah. there's there's any number of reasons. I mean, you've got you've got um, the the nodal adaptations, like an SA node adaptation, will lower resting heart rate, and and you know that doesn't require any other adaptation for that to happen. And so people say, well, you're much more parasympathetic, and it's like, well, okay, um, yeah, how you measure how you measure in that? So yeah. again, I I just don't care. It really doesn't matter. It's like the stuff that within my scope that I can measure is the stuff that matters to me. And do you and, think uh, you think including blood vessels by doing like hard isometrics could actually change total peripheral resistance and then affect cardiac output? Uh, it 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 would I for, so from my perspective, it's going to depend on what the return towards the heart does, right? Right. So if we, if we think about the front side mechanics of all of this going on, so the blood leaves the heart and then the, the pressure um, and then the gradients that are associated with pulling nutrients out of the bloodstream go into the tissues. And on the back side, I have a return of byproducts of metabolism that, that feed into the venous system. And that's what actually determines what your heart rate is. Um, and so if I have an accumulation of byproducts 
that will draw more fluid into the bloodstream, then potentially what I have done is I've increased that volume, which means that I have to increase the heart rate, which means that I could probably reach that point um, perhaps easier or quicker or however you want to perceive that as getting to that point where the isovolumetric phase disappears. And then I do have higher cardiac output as a, as a, as a result of that. Um, from a training perspective, I don't know if that, if that is sufficient enough to create an adaptation that would be identified in a non-exercise um, atmosphere, but I could certainly see it carrying over from a training perspective. So would you say it's beneficial when you have a repeat sprint athlete to try to figure out ways to shorten or to lessen the isovolumetric phase? I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know that I'm, I'm that concerned about it. I'm more concerned in that case with something like maintaining power output, you know, as fatigue is superimposed. Um, that would be more important to me. Anyway, okay. um, because I don't give a rat's patootie what your cardiac output is if you're being successful, right? Or if you're not being successful, I can't tell you if it's cardiac output or not. So again, does it even matter? Right. 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 We're looking at outcome based training, right? You know, if we're in the lab and we want to measure, we want to answer the question of like what's happening in these circumstances, then I think it's very reasonable to ask those questions. But if we're training in the real world and I don't have access to this stuff without a great deal of complication or, or time consumption, then I don't, I don't see a point. Got it. it just, like I said, it just, and, and again, you, you've heard me say this a bunch of times, Chris, is that if, you know, if I can't measure it, um, you know, I can't, I don't care. Right. It just, it just doesn't matter <laughs> to me. Right. doesn't mean it's not important. It just doesn't matter to me at that point in time because yeah. I'll read the research. I mean, I'll read it with great fascination as to what's going on. But again, when we're talking about ac acute manipulation of variables and an attempt to make a performance related change in an individual under certain circumstances in a very specific context, then, you know, good luck with that. Try to measure that for me. It's just not going to happen. You know, it's like asking people, asking me why someone has pain. <laughs> Good luck with that. I mean, we don't know. You know, we have explanations of things, but we just don't know why that person has pain. Right? Is that helpful at all? Yeah, I think it's just good to have a varying opinion when everyone yeah. is so caught up on one specific thing. Yeah, I mean, but you know, there's nothing wrong with endurance based training to improve, you know, components of fitness associated with certain types of, of, you know, uh, uh, sport or behavior. Right. Yeah. Um, but, but again, we should always be focused on the outcome. We can have, we can have a background of understanding that provides us an intent, but when we're, when it comes right down to it, we're not measuring it. I, I have no way for me to measure cardiac output. So, who cares? Anything else? Anyone? Nothing? Okay, let's go to the questions. Let me find my questions. One second. So that was, okay. How do you condition someone who is fit, but motorically, motorically, never use that word, unable to avoid their pain? Well, that's a really good question um, because pain tends to supersede everything. It's, pain becomes very important because it hurts and can potentially mean that something important is happening. That's what it's for. It's a signal that we need to pay attention to something. It doesn't mean that we're broken or damaged, although it could mean that we're broken or damaged. How about that for definitive answers? Um, but from a conditioning standpoint, we have to determine what it is we're trying to achieve. So it would be good to have a, a predetermined goal or outcome that we're, we're training for and then try to figure out some other way to do that. So if I have a lower extremity injury, I can drive adaptations that will support an outcome in some other way. Um, but, but because of the, the said principle, um, it would still need to be specific. 
So there might be elements of conditioning that I can do for just about anybody, but um, but I would say that that um, you know if if their pain is interrupting something that is specific in regards to their conditioning program, then there's not going to be a whole lot that you're going to be able to do until that that situation is resolved until you have sufficient variability in the system to move adequately so they're not in pain or you're able to resolve um, a condition that is determined to be foundational to why they're having the pain experience in the first place so again do I have a sprain strain situation that's not going to allow me allow me to to uh, perform a certain way but if we understand as much of the integrated elements so for instance um, the position of your body influences your ability to breathe. And so maybe there's something that we can do there that promotes a, a much more uh, variable or specifically effective breathing pattern that might support that activity later on. So that could be one element that we could train. And again, some form of cross training or, or supplementing or substituting rather um, some other form of training to support um, whatever we can, but there may always be a limitation in, in what we can achieve because of a, a, of a painful situation or an injury. So I don't think that this is a, you know, a, a, a complicated situation um, because again, you're going to make some logical, rational decisions, but there might be some hidden things that you might be able to do to uh, enhance those capabilities. The ability to, to promote a more effective inhalation, the ability to promote a more effective exhalation under certain circumstances, and then superimpose whatever type of conditioning that can be done um, to support the aspects of the central components of the heart and the circulation can be trained in any number of ways, but keep in mind that the specificity will always be an issue. And that's based on what we just talked about in regards to how the circulatory system behaves, because it's the specificity of that that's going to drive the the ultimate adaptations that are going to support the, the sporting activity or the physical activity in question. Any problem with that? Bill, do you think there's a, do you think there's a, a magic anaerobic threshold that once you exceed it and you're glycolytic that you start actually killing mitochondria? Do you think that's actually what's happening? Like there's like there's like a magic heart rate, you cross the barrier, and then instantly everything changes. No. Well, yeah, they use they use like a modified Cooper <laughs> test, and then you figure out your approximate anaerobic threshold, and then it's like the more yeah. time you spend above that, you're going glycolytic, and that has this this creates this dangerous environment for aerobic adaptation. Right. It's 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 probably not that clean. So if, so if 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 all energy at uh, energy systems are active at the same time, we never really know what percentage of each is contributing at any one moment. And so I would argue that that well, there's a probably a point where we have this this transition, you know, past a certain point where I start to increase the amount of anaerobic contribution to meet the the, the demands of the activity, um, I don't think it's like, and, and I'm pretty sure, and I, and don't, don't quote me on this, but I, I can't remember if it was the Japanese researchers that basically kind of destroyed the anaerobic threshold concept as, as a true marker quite a few years ago. Because what they used to say is that you would do your, your VO2 max test and you could see the break point where um, um, and you could, they used to graph the, the, uh, um, oxygen, uh, yeah, yeah. They used to they, they, they used to uh, monitor the VO2, and there was be like a break point, and they'd say that's probably your probably your anaerobic threshold. But I mean, there's definitely a point where you're you're going to transition into more and more anaerobic contributions, but it's but it's simultaneous, right? You're always you're always playing with both of those, um, but. Um, you know, the more you rely on anaerobicus, then the more likely you're dealing with apoptosis of, of mitochondria. Yeah, that's one of the, and, and we, we, we try to buffer against that by, by making their last phase before they go off to, to camp or preseason or whatever, by making them a little bit more um, 
you know, higher intensity, longer duration kind of stuff that would, would rely on that concept because that's what they end up doing at camp way too much. Instead of preparing to play their sport, they have to, we have to prepare them for camp. Yeah. To manage the. Yeah. Crazy yeah. That. And, and so you, so you build up enough of this, whatever it is that we're building up, whether it be aerobic enzymes and structures and mitochondria and such. And then you hope that you have built it up enough that whatever would get compromised by changing the demands of the activity um, is, is still above the level that they would you know, need from a beneficial standpoint to perform their sport. Right. What's, and what do you think the best way to monitor that or like find the actual ceiling would be? Ceiling for what? Um, I mean, I, I know, I, you know, there's like, there's devices that can tell me like how I'm, my muscles are desaturating oxygen. So those can mm -hmm. be used as tools to help me figure out when I should cut something short. Yeah. You know, it's a little different, but yeah. Is there, is there a way without that, that you use? Well, subjectively. Yeah. I mean, that, I, I think that supersedes everything. Yeah. Right. Cause, cause you have people that can tolerate these low oxygen conditions for a really long periods of time. So, so take a, uh, uh, the free divers. Yeah. So free divers, free divers live in anaerobicus, right? Um, and, and, and if you watch the, the, I don't know what they call it anymore. We used to call it respiratory quotient, the RQ value, which would tell you whether you're, you're, you're able to utilize, um, uh, like what energy substrate you're using for, for yeah. uh, our energy production, right? And if you call watch that, RER. what's that? They also call it like RER value. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's either RQ or RR or RER or something. Yeah. Anyway, anyway, it's been a long time since I looked at that. But, but if you look at how, like if you monitor a free diver, so they're going to hold their breath for ridiculously long periods of time, so four minutes at a time. So how do they do that? They actually shift towards anaerobic metabolism. And, and, and so then all of their systems are, are, and they're totally cool and comfortable with it. I'm sure they, you know, they can tell the difference, right? But, yeah. but they, they've experienced it enough that it becomes a non-threatening situation to them where you and I hold our breath for 35 seconds and we start to feel the air hunger and, and, and right away we want to take that breath and they're just very well trained to tolerate it. So if I have an athlete that has that capacity and can maintain power output under those circumstances, then by all means, I mean, who am I to say don't do that? Don't they have a tremendous amount of red blood cells too? Like the, they empty, they basically empty their spleens of blood cells. They have like yeah. much higher volumes of that. I, I haven't looked at it enough to, to give you a yay or nay on that. I was like, I was just re reading research from like Patrick McEwen's work with Buteco stuff. Oh, uh, okay. Um, you ever do any of the, the like CO2 tolerance stuff with breath holding and exercise and a little breathing? bit, a little bit. I, mean, I don't, I don't make it. With, with breath yeah. Holding. I don't make it right. It's just a nice way to kind of test yourself just to see, see what your, your capacities are. But I don't spend you know, a lot not of time. You're not taping anybody's mouth shut and having them do circuit training? No. <laughs> no. Don't really see the point in that. No, it's just a nice way to see what your what your, your tolerance is. So if you're a hyperventilator, you know, you're not going to be able to hold your breath for very long after you exhale. And so it's just a nice way to sort of classify yourself and it's a nice way to measure some self-improvement um, you know, in your in your ability to, to tolerate. So, cool. How's everybody doing? Corey, hey, give me a thumbs up, brother. All right, thank you. All right. You, actually, huh? got a question for you, actually. You got a question? Far away, man. Yeah, I'll take a question. A little bit off energy systems, but. Uh oh. Kinda, it's not going too far off, okay? It's um, touched on this a little while ago. It's about like structural adaptations to like strength training. Okay. So, if you're training athletes, you're kind of altering force production capabilities, right? Kind of. Mm -hmm. You are. <laughs> so yeah. can we, based on the exercise we choose and we inadvertently change like pination angle, gear ratio, stuff like that, can we put them at more risk for injury than before based on this kind of stuff? 
That's a, that's a really good question. Um, my, my personal bias is probably, um, you know, with a, with a caveat under undertone of, I'm not absolutely sure, but I, but I, I lean in that direction. Um, and, and the, what I would use as an example. So if I'm training somebody with exclusively, um, high force, but low speed activities, and I do alter those, those ratios, right? So I'm, I'm changing the, the pination angle. So the ability of that, that muscle to contract quicker based on its physical structure. And then if I sustain a contraction for too long a period of time, and then the mechanics change as the, the joint position changes, and therefore the muscle position changes. And now I have a potential situation where I would overload a muscle that is incapable of tolerating the forces that are being applied, then potentially, yes, I do have an injury. So if you, if you took like a hamstring and you, you, you know, like the bicep femoris has a little bit of both, like the, the, as, as far as it's change in pination angle. But if I altered that significantly with just pure slow speed oriented concentric emphasis kind of stuff, then maybe I do, maybe I do, but I would hope that, you know, we've all done enough sp specific work that overcomes that concern that we wouldn't really train. Like I wouldn't take a soccer player and, and put him on the, the traditional West side template of powerlifting in the hopes that, that I'm, I'm making him a better soccer player. You know, um, even if I did strength train him to some degree in that, in that regard, he would still be performing his specific work and you would hope that that, that would, potentially be enough, but I don't think I've ever trained anybody that way anyway. But yeah, I think that, that we need to attend to that. We can't, but again, I can't measure that. And so how much of that is too much and too little, um, that's where you get to be a coach, right? Do you ever yeah. think it'd be enough to the point where you maybe wouldn't give someone a deadlift just because it's mostly gonna be a concentric and maybe give them squats and stuff because it'll have an eccentric and concentric? I have, I, I have very good reasons not to give people deadlifts uh, for that reason. So, yeah, there's reasons not to do that, right? Um, there's definitely reasons to do that under some other circumstances. But that comes into the, the play in regards to whether I have a need for greater uh, concentric or eccentric orientation of certain um, relationships in regards to force production because you know, internal pressures are produced in, in, in certain ways. And some of that requires an eccentric orientation and some of it requires a concentric orientation of some of the musculature that controls those pressures. And um, so again, that, that was, that's where I would lean in regards to exercise selection. Cool. Awesome, thanks. All right. So what's the best way to create buy-in for a client who thinks rest is all they need post-injury? Well, you got a couple of options here. You could just let them rest and say, how's that going for you? Um, or you could show them that they can remain very, very active and, and still um, work on restoring um, different aspects of their physiology that they may need, uh, assuming that they're, we're returning them to some form of activity. Um, and then maybe give them an opportunity to actually recognize their ability to be successful. Um, but I would, I would say that from a communicative standpoint, um, if, if somebody believes that rest is going to be the best thing for them, they're going to rest. And there's not gonna be a whole lot you're gonna do about that, assuming that they have an element of control of their own care. So if we're dealing with a sports team or some, some way, shape, or form, they usually don't have that capacity. They're, they're sort of required by association that they're going to have to participate in some form of training or, or rehab. Where we're in the general pop situation, I can't make anybody do anything they don't want to do. But if I can show them a measure of success or, or uh, progress towards something that they do desire, 
in regards to do, doing some form of active intervention versus passively resting, then potentially I have the opportunity to buy in. But that's part of your communication with whoever you're dealing with, whatever the client um, is concerned about. Um, and maybe if you knew that, then maybe you could potentially move them towards that. So that could be getting someone to come in. And again, using the, the example of a lower extremity injury. So he has a lower extremity injury, then you bring him in and you do something that doesn't influence the injury negatively. And then ultimately the exercise makes them feel better. And they say, okay, this is probably a good thing. Or, or I show them the ability to change um, by some other form of intervention that I may use in the clinic. And they do something that they couldn't do before or they actually feel better. And then again, the, the best way to get buy-in is to make some form of change that the client can appreciate. But you have to understand what the client appreciates before you intervene. Otherwise you might be wasting your time. Interesting question. All right. Does anybody have anything specific? Shall I dive into the next question? I will dive into the next question since you guys are so vocal. All right. Assuming we're starting from scratch, how would you build up repeat sprint ability and what physical qualities are you targeting? Targeting Example, increased mitochondria. Well, I think we kind of touched on the uh, whole mitochondrial development concept a little bit earlier that I have no idea how many mitochondria you have. I have no idea how many mitochondria you're making, regardless of what type of training or intervention that we're using. So I'm gonna kind of take that one off the board. My goal is to target an outcome and that requires having some information. So um, since I know who asked this question, I will pick, uh, I'll pick a sport and, and use that as a, as a point of reference. So. If I'm training hockey players and some of the information I might need to know is how long are their shifts? Because, you know, at the college level, the shifts are a certain length, high schools are a certain length, pros are, are a certain length. And so if I know what, what the duration of the shift and then how many shifts they might be exposed to, and then if I have a general idea of what heart rate they're, they're playing at, that provides me a great deal of information in regards to developing a profile of what we're trying to achieve um, in regards to the repeatability of, of energy um, production or better yet, um, power output in the presence of fatigue. Um, so you could get all um, in, into like an old school field test, like a running based anaerobic sprint test, um, which will give you a measurement of of power output over time. So it's a re repeated 30 meter sprints. Um, and I can't remember the rest period. I think it's 30 seconds rest between 30 meter sprints. And then you measure the times, you know the distance, and then you know what their body weight is. And then that allows you to calculate velocities and power outputs. And so you can measure the, the, the maintenance or decline of power over time, and as well as the opposite power. There's also another one where you, you just compare times and then you come up with a um, sort of like a uh, percentage quotient of, of power decline in comparison to the first three sprints versus the last three sprints. And so again, that just gives me a, a sort of like a field measure of that specific test. I would much prefer to have a profile based on whatever they're trying to come back to, whether, so like a basketball player. Okay, so how many starts and stops? What's the longest distance that they have to cover? You know, how fast do they have to uh, to perform these activities, what are the forces involved, how much rest is in between. Um, if I don't have that calculation, then I can actually use the sport itself as a measure. And so if I need to increase the number of short intervals, then I cut the, the uh, game from full court to half court. Um, I can tighten up the spaces so, so, and I can reduce the number of players. And so I can manipulate all those things to increase or decrease the extent of, a, of an interval of training. Um, so you're, you're dealing with like a, a short-sighted game situation, which they do in like soccer is, is very well known for, for using that strategy. Um, and they'll build that up from, 
you know, three on three, four on four to, to a full game. So again, I can manipulate all of those parameters depending on what I'm trying to achieve. And if I needed to increase some level of conditioning on top of that, I can build in, you know, some form of cue or activity. So after, after you score a goal in hockey, you have to sprint to the opposite red line and back um, to add conditioning on top of that within a drill. So if I have a, of a coach that has an understanding of, of, of these principles in regards to, um, to training, then you can actually organize practice to support that. I don't know how much of that that actually happens. Um, but again, that, that might be where we can influence things in that regard. But again, I think you have to have some sort of some sort of uh, standard or profile to work from and then determine what what the, the desired outcome um, is separate from that. And then you close the gap. And if I, again, if I need shorter intervals, I do shorter activities on, on more repeats. I can extend the, the, the rest duration. So let's just say that my hockey shifts are 30 seconds and, and I start with full recoveries in that regard over time. And I just slowly reduce the, the time span in between until I get to what is the typical work rest ratio of that sport based on um, the, the predetermined profile. That would be my favorite way to do it. That way it's 100%, 100% specific. Um, and that doesn't mean you don't do supplementary work. So, you know, if you would do tempo workouts, which is great because they're, they, they're relatively fast um, and they do um, increase um, the, the endurance component as well. And so again, they tend to be a little bit more specific for, for those types of sports. It doesn't mean you wouldn't do anything like that. It doesn't mean you do any of the shorter interval stuff, but you know, if you had to return somebody to a sport, what could be better than to actually use the sport as the developmental uh, component as well? Any questions? I think I got one more question, guys. <clears throat> when someone has a better, oh, go ahead. That. If, so, how much influence do we really have over that specificity? If like you're going to run X amount of sprints during a soccer game, but you can only do so many of those during a workout session. Right. No, I, I, and again, you, you're you're right. And so again, that it, but it pays to know that. And then we can kind of determine, okay, so if we know that we have this volume that we have to be able to tolerate, then maybe I have to manipulate it. And now I have some supplementary training that I have to organize. And that's why I say in a perfect world, I would use the sport, right? Um, but sometimes you got to run, we used to run Steeler 350s when I was in high school. You know what those are? So, so it, the, 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 if you go around the perimeter of the football field, it's roughly 350 yards, give or take. So we used to do those, right? So you, you sprint the, the length of the field, you jog the end zone, and you sprint the other end of the field, and we would do repeats of those um, for our conditioning. Now, there was no science behind that at that point, but you could use something like that to accumulate volume at a certain intensity if you had an idea of what the heart rate might be that you need to, to be able to, to perform, then you can manipulate the, the duration of the intervals and then the rest period to maintain whatever heart rate you need to, to sort of fit the profile that you've established, All right? So again, if you can't use the sport because the volume's insufficient, then that's where the supplementary training really comes into play. And this is a big deal. So when we, if we're, hey, let's bring rehab into this for a second. So this is one of those big deals about the guys that return to sport a little early um, it, because they can, but they may not be fit enough. And um, if you have those predetermined volumes and intensities and, and the needs of that individual athlete, now you kind of know where their return to play point really is. Because if I got a guy that, that comes off a knee injury, but the knee feels great, but he's not physically fit enough because he didn't do enough other work while he was rehabbing, 
then I need to do that work before I decide to, to bring him back to play, right? Because he's more likely to get hurt because he's not going to be fit enough because now as he fatigues, power output goes down, um, his movement capabilities are going to be compromised, and then you're back to square one with a, with a potential increased risk of injury. So would the test you do like pre-injury be specific to the sport or just a general test that you'd want him to hit those markers after his rehab to show he's back to where he was kind of thing? Well, there are some, there are some tests that, that appear to have some um, um, association with, with certain sports. Is the, Chris, do you guys use anything with ultimate in, in regards to your pre-test? Chris? Yeah, so we do, I mean, we, we just accumulate, in the preseason, we just accumulate volume of tempo running, honestly, and then volume of sprinting leading up to play. And, and Yeah, I don't, I don't know that there's any one test that, that would give you, I think, uh, like, the, like the yo-yo test. Yeah, yo-yo or, two. yeah the, we use yo-yo two with teams if they're interested in yeah. knowing testing, and then we use it for post, but... Yeah, because with soccer uh, or beep test or something along those lines where they have to maintain a certain output over a period of time, there, there are some associations with sports that you can use sort of as a, as a, as a, a profiling test. But ultimately, again, I think that if you're, if you're observing if you're a coach and you look at certain behaviors, you know, I think you can kind of tell when people get tired and slow down and all you need to do is monitor that. I think that we get a little carried away with a, an attempt to, to be um, scientific um, when the reality is, is there's a lot of information that's right in front of us if we just pay attention to it. And it might be, make it harder, right? Because it's really easy to just say, hey, we're going to do this field test and then we're going to train and then we're going to do this field test again, right? But again, does it even help us for instance, why do they still do 300-yard shuttles with football players? When they're That's how they've always done it. Well, yeah, yeah, exactly. They've always done it that way. <laughs> but, again, not useful and probably puts them at risk for injury because, again, they're, they're taking them away from the, the type of training that is valuable to their sport, right? All right. I got one more question, and then – We'll figure out what we're going to do or we'll shut her down. So when someone has a better resting heart rate and heart rate recovery, can we attribute that to an improved ability to shift into a more parasympathetic state or adaptations to their ability to deliver oxygen to the tissue? No. Okay. That was easy. That was Campo. That's why I gave him that, that answer. Um, <laughs> we, can't, we can't tell. We can't tell if they're more parasympathetic or not, unless we have some direct way to measure that. So I suppose if we had somebody tracking a real-time HRV under those circumstances, we might be able to, to come up with something. Um, but, but once again, it's, it's like, okay, what value is it to know that? Um, what we're looking for is an individual that, that if he needs to, can perform rest and repeat, if that's the case. Um, so I'm not really concerned whether they're parasympathetic or not. Um, but heart rate recovery would be indicative of somebody that, that probably manages the byproducts of metabolism a whole lot better. Because again, we go back to the initial explanation of how the heart works in relationship to metabolism. It's metabolism that determines the heart rate. So if I'm better able to manage metabolism, if I'm better able to produce energy without having to produce a massive amount of, of uh, strong ions that are associated with say anaerobic metabolism that get fed back into the venous circulation, which then draw fluid into the venous circulation, which then has to increase heart rate to maintain the cardiac output. Then in that case, we can say that it's not the delivery that's the problem, it's actually the production of the byproducts and the, and the tissues themselves that are being used. And so, Again, I would say that there's definitely value in monitoring those heart rates, but whether it's parasympathetic or not, I don't really care. What I care is, can you recover in time to do that again 
and be as good as you were the last time or experience the minimum of drop off because that is not only a performance enhancer, but that's one of my protectors in regards to potential for injury, in my opinion. Because if you get tired, everything becomes more difficult. You lose motor control and um, you're going to have to can you know find some form of compensatory strategy to allow you to accomplish a task which many people do very very well and never have any problems but obviously there are many many people that don't and those are the people that i get to see in the clinic so um once again i think that uh, there's a lot of stuff that we could measure and find out what it is after the fact as long as we can um observe and and uh, determine what our best outcomes would be and then just train them appropriately again I, I'm, I'm trying to get away from um, trying to be as definitive in regards to oh it's this energy system oh it's this system when the reality is we can have that conversation over dinner and it's really fascinating but in the reality it just doesn't help us at all you think do you think, Bill, that the fatigue could possibly be affecting the order of water and then that's going to change how you manage pressures? The hydrogen ions specifically and like potassium? Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, your strong ions are going are gonna to certainly influence how that, that is structured. Um, does it influence the, the ability to move so we, you know, the ATP is important because of how it structures water. And so if I have anything that interrupts that, uh, that my capability of producing sufficient, and I don't know if we're ever really insufficient at all, but, but, um, but again, you got certain things that feed back on certain systems and then those are being sensed, right? So we gotta always give credit to the type, is it type three afferents that are sensing the, the, uh, internal cellular environment that are giving me information in regards to um, am I at risk, am I feeling some, or not, not, I'm feeling fatigued, that would be something that the brain would output, but at least the information that's coming from the, the internal environment of the cell is going to determine how we perceive that activity to be and whether or not we need to protect ourselves by stopping or by reducing power outputs and such. The metabolism is is infinitely more important and more interesting to me now, um, but and and I don't want to take away the fascination of the cardiac system because obviously that's really cool. Uh, when you find out that that it's metabolically driven, it's not a, it's not about not, not so much about the chamber size and the fact that you know if I can get blood to flow through the heart without it beating, that's pretty cool. <clears throat> Anything else, gentlemen? I'm assuming they're all gentlemen. There's somebody on there that I don't recognize. Any questions? Well, that was fun and interesting. Thanks for everybody for showing up. Um, this is IFAST University, and I am assuming we will continue to do these on a monthly basis. So please sign up and we will see you next month.